plus $3 shipping. Use your credit card or send check or money order to Nat King Cole, P.O. Box 8250, Atlanta, Georgia. Remember, save COD charges by sending check or money order or use your credit card. To our viewers around the world, peace on earth from CNN. Bargain hunters in Moscow line up for bread, hoping to beat the post-holiday price hikes. Limiting Japanese imports may be politically correct, but is it economically sensible? After 12 years of guerrilla warfare and death squad atrocities, the 75,000 victims of El Salvador's civil war may soon rest in peace. From CNN, this is The World Today. Thanks for joining us. I'm Catherine Cryer. Frank Sesno is off today. Imagine waking tomorrow to find prices for food, clothes, gasoline, almost anything you can buy, doubling, tripling, quadrupling. That's what Russians face on January 2nd, when state price subsidies disappear and free market economics take over. A few stores were open on New Year's Day, and CNN's Marina Marabella found many Muscovites taking advantage of one final bargain. In Moscow, the new year began much as the old one ended. People in line waiting for a loaf of bread. This is unbelievable. Standing in line on a holiday, it's crazy. This is the last time these Muscovites will be able to buy bread at state-subsidized prices. Today, a loaf costs about one ruble, the equivalent of one cent. On Thursday, price controls will end in Russia. The cost of necessities will triple. Bread will cost the equivalent of three cents a loaf. That's a huge increase in a country where the average weekly wage is less than 100 rubles, about one dollar. Things are already difficult. I don't agree with higher prices. They'll only make life worse. Many Russians will have to buy less and watch what they eat. Meat and vegetables will be five times more expensive. Other goods could jump even higher. Salaries will not keep up. The higher prices are part of radical economic reforms intended to encourage production and move Russia to a free market system. This is the only way for us. The state has no more money. It can't go on subsidizing prices. We have to go along with this. I have two children, and I'm prepared to make sacrifices for their future. Despite that optimism, many here are apprehensive about an uncertain future. President Boris Yeltsin has asked Russians not to panic in the face of severe reforms. But some are worried higher prices could provoke anger and lead to violence. The transition from a state-controlled economy to a free market system will be painful and will take many months. But the government here hopes that profit will serve as a powerful engine that drives the Russian system and makes it more efficient. Marina Mirabella, CNN, Moscow. President Bush is in Australia, the first leg of a four-nation trade mission to the Pacific Rim. He's held two meetings with Prime Minister Paul Keating and is due to address the Australian Parliament about three and a half hours from now. Although generally well received, Mr. Bush has ruffled a few political feathers, especially angry Australian farmers. They're demanding the president slash the U.S. agricultural subsidies they say are driving them out of business. Japan will be the fourth and final stop on Mr. Bush's current international trip, topping the president's election year agenda while he's in Tokyo, working out a way to shrivel the ballooning import-export imbalance between Japan and the United States. Automobiles and car parts account for about three-fourths of Japan's trade surplus. CNN's Ed Garston explores the implications of this situation. Call it invasion of the market snatchers. The steady stream of Japanese-made cars arriving on U.S. shores has snatched a third of the market from the Detroit Big Three. This is an inadequate, um, it's not comfortable, comfortable to the uh, Japanese vehicle at all. So next week, the leaders of GM, Ford, and Chrysler will join President Bush in trying to convince the Japanese to reduce the number of cars they export to the United States and help give their struggling companies a fighting chance. But car buyers in the U.S. drive in varying lanes of thought on the issue. The United States is going to try to limit um, the number of cars. It seems like uh, the worst kind of protectionism. It would upset me to have less to choose from. Um, and considering what's going to be available, if there were no imported cars, I'd be very upset. I think we need some restrictions until they let us let our cars into their country. 
I don't think I don't think it's going to have a meaningful impact. Neither does Auto Week publisher Leon Mandel. Japanese reduction in exports, I believe, will matter not a whit. The Japanese already have agreed to limit the number of cars that they ship from Japan to the U.S. They don't ship as many cars as they're allowed to ship. They don't need to because they manufacture enough cars in the United States. They're called transplants. Well, for example, the Japanese Honda Accord is actually made in Marysville, Ohio. Indeed, Japanese automakers Nissan and Toyota are also U.S. automakers, operating transplant operations in the U.S. If imports are cut, the transplants could simply step up production where the Japanese could build more plants on U.S. soil. The fact is, since the mid-1980s, the Japanese have actually decreased the number of cars and trucks they've exported to the U.S. by more than a million. But at least one expert says where the cars are made isn't so much the issue anymore, but where the parts are made that go into them. The Japanese may produce cars in the U.S., but most of the car parts come from Japan. But then again, Detroit's big three are using fewer domestically made parts, too. A structural change has to take place in the way the manufacturer-supplier relationship works in this country before a lot of that imbalance is redressed. Which all means it doesn't seem to matter if the invasion of the market snatchers is slowed. They've already penetrated U.S. shores to the point where they'll not only survive, but multiply as well. Ed Garston, CNN, Detroit. Before leaving on his trip to Asia, President Bush said his highest priority is jobs for Americans through free trade. That, too, would appear to be his number one challenge, as the unemployment rate stands at 6.8% going into an election year. Frank Sesno now on job prospects for 1992. For American workers, 1991 was a tactical route. In November alone, nearly a quarter of a million more were inducted into the Army of Unemployed, where prospects are grim. A person specifically ought to lower their sights, both in terms of wage as well as status. The job losses, most of them permanent, have come like casualty figures from an economic battlefield. Corporate America burying its own. General Motors, 74,000. Sears, 33,000. IBM, 20,000. AT&T, 14,000. Averaged out, nearly 4,000 job cuts announced per business day just since October 1st. And many of these professional jobs taking a heavy toll on the nation's psyche. I have to be crazy not to be concerned. I have a mortgage, I have a family, and uh, I got bills just like you do. People are getting laid off, so just as a whole in the country, it's kind of scary. And people who are scared don't spend, hurting the economy even more. A recent survey revealed nearly half think unemployment is the top economic issue facing the country now. It's hardly surprising. In retail alone over the last three years, more than 350,000 jobs have disappeared. The American Bankers Association says 40,000 positions in that sector have been eliminated. A largely white-collar recession could spell big trouble for the GOP. Traditionally, the unemployed don't vote, but this group of unemployed is likely to show up at the polls. I also think it has an effect on, on the neighbors of the unemployed. In 1988, George Bush promised a professional paradise. We will be able to produce 30 million jobs in the next eight years, and we will do it. Instead, recession, retrenchment, hard times. According to the Workplace Trends newsletter, corporate America has announced the permanent elimination of nearly one million jobs since Bush was elected. We are, for, for political planning purposes, we're running scared. Despite low interest rates, a sober realism dominates the Bush campaign. We have to assume that the economy will still be bad and that consumer confidence and the psychology about the economy will not be good and, and plan to uh, run the campaign next fall in a negative economic environment. And historically, that's a very hostile political environment. Since World War II, with the exception of Eisenhower in 1956, the incumbent party has lost every time when job growth has been stalled six months before the election. The prospects now? We will see an unemployment rate stays at the same level until late in the uh, summer or early in the fall of 1992. And even then, job growth is going to be very slow. 
Some sectors, engineering, health care, are experiencing growth. But overall, concerns about job security will persist in 1992, from the folks on Main Street to the man on Pennsylvania Avenue. Frank Sesno, CNN, Washington. And still ahead on the world today, the seeds of bitterness between Serbians and Croatians take root in the United States. And renewed concern over the safety of a nuclear weapons plant triggers concern over the health of nearby residents. How can you tell a raisin nut from an ordinary raisin? Raisin nuts shop in big and tall shops. They are frequently mistaken for dirigibles. And they have a heck of a time hiding behind trees. But the best way to spot a raisin nut is to taste one. Because when you take a 